Today, you're going to hear from an incredible man of God. He's a church planner. Their church is about a year and two months old. Give Pastor Russ Emanuel a big barefoot church welcome. Let him know how glad you are. He came today. Man, we're honored to have you, bro. Glad All to right. be here. Come glad on. to be here. What honor it is to be able to be here with you today. Share. Give honor to your pastor. And his wife, Kim and Cole. What a great life coach you have as a pastor. That's right. That's right. The Bible says that we honor those that are doing the work of the Lord. And he, he is a, a great inspiration to me. He has really motivated me. Just, just to let, I love his enthusiasm for God. I mean, he gets you pumped up even whenever you don't even feel like it. He gets you hyped up. He has a great enthusiasm. He's doing great things here for the kingdom of God. He's not on, I had to stand on this top step here to give him high five. He's a, he's a giant dude, but he's also a giant in the kingdom of God. And Myrtle Beach will never be the same. Your life will never be the same because the man of God that God has placed in your life. So make sure that you honor that and, and that you honor him and, and you pray for him. Sometimes we don't always understand what's going on in the church. As he begins to cast vision and he lets you know the things that are going on, you need to catch that vision. You need to carry it out to the world. And as you begin to do that, you know, you might think in your mind, well, I, I don't always agree with that. You pray for the man of God. And, and don't pray, you know, that God will change his mind. Ch pray that God will change your mind so you will be able to see the vision clearly and, and carry it out the way that God has orchestrated it here. He's doing great things here. I'm just so glad to be able to be here with you guys today. I know it's a lot of information real quick. I'm going to try to slow down a little bit because I'm really excited, but I'm um, just glad to be able to be here. I always consider it an honor to be able to come here because we come here, you know, to minister to others, but at the same time, we get ministered to as well because you have a great team here. Um, they always take care of us. And North Myrtle Beach is a very special place. It's where I met my wife 14 years ago. Next month, she probably couldn't remember that, but I do. Um, just, just right around the corner. And, and this is, it's like a honeymoon when we get to come here. So we're, we're really excited to be able to be here with you this weekend. Um, our children were not able to come with us because they're back at our home church in Clinton, North Carolina, ministering. They play on the worship team. We have an 8-year-old that plays the drums, a 15-year-old that plays the bass. Our daughter is 12, or is it 11? I get it mixed up. There's so many of them. 11, she sings. And we have an 18-year-old back in the back that's a tech man that handles things for us. So um, we're, we're real grateful for them. And I always like to honor them because they're doing things for the kingdom of God. And, and our home church, we've been in a 21 days of fasting and prayer, and it, it ends today. And, and what fasting is is just typically you're abstaining from food or, or something of significance that you feel that is significant, and you're just kind of making room for God to be able to come in. We've disconnected from the world, so to speak, and we're just spending those 21 days in fasting and prayer to just kind of reconnect with God and, and rekindle some things. And he has done some, some great things in our life over these 21 days, but we're glad that today is ending as well. So, so we actually get to, to absorb some food today at the church. So we're, we're grateful that he's given us the strength and the ability to be able to do that. And our whole family's been doing it. Um, even my little eight-year-old son, he is not eating any sweets in 21 days, and that is something marvelous for an eight-year-old, um, and, and he came home from school earlier this week, and he was like, Daddy, I had to give my cookies away at lunch, man, uh, but I said, you know what, son, God is going to honor that, and throughout the fast, he's been praying, he's our drummer at church, he's been praying, he said, you know, I just want God to use me to be able to play the drums, and God is going to use him in a phenomenal way because of the sacrifices that he's been making to at eight years old, to draw himself closer to God. And we can't escape those moral fabrics uh, or those values that are placed in us at, as a, at an early age. Um, I thank God that I had parents that, that raised me, that church was not optional. It was mandatory. I mean, you, you had to go, and if you had any rebuttals, you got the brakes beat off of you, and then you had to go anyway. So, I mean, you better off just say, yeah, I'm ready to go this morning. <laughs> but but we are, we're so thankful for those those people like that in our life that, you know, just raise us up in a, in a godly way. But we, we didn't all, I wasn't always a pastor. I didn't always live a, a, a good life for God. And, and there was a, a stretch or a period of time there in my life where, you know, I was just trying to escape the plan that God had for me. 
But because of those things that my parents had instilled in me at an at a early age, I just couldn't get away from them. And Luke won't be able to get away from them. So, so we're thankful for those areas in our life. And, and at the age of 29 years old, I was able to um, accept Christ as leader of my life, CEO, life was salvaged, baptized two weeks prior to getting married, and able to put on my God jersey. And, and God just began to do something great in my life at, at that time. And, and he was just building this momentum, you know, to really give me a sense that I could actually live life on purpose for him. And I, I finally felt like that I was achieving that. And, and as I began to experience that momentum, I found myself just creating time for God, creating space for him to be able to, to operate in my life. And, and as I began to create that space, he began to do, you know, some wonderful things. And I, I had this new life. I was, I was in the game. I was running uh, the amazing race for actually for the first time for the team that actually wins. And, and, and I want to rep my jersey for you today. This is my God jersey. You see it all the time on TV. You see all the athletes. They're trying to rep their name. But I want to rep Jesus Christ today because he is the one that has salvaged me. He is the one that has redeemed me. He is the one that has brought life back into a dead situation when they're at that age of 29. So I'm thankful for that. And I, I wear this shirt with great dignity today. I haven't hardly taken it off since I got it. So I, I wear it with a sense of pride because I want people to understand that we're running this amazing race in life for a purpose. God has a purpose for me and he has a purpose for you. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. And we want to kind of draw out some relevant points here that help us understand that we're in the amazing race. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 26. And it says, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. Paul here is the author of this letter to the Corinthian people, and he is just drawing some distinct parallels between actually running a race physically, and he's also comparing it to running the amazing race that we're in called life spiritually. But there's only one winner, Paul says. He says everybody's in the race running, but there's only going to be one winner. So why not run the, way, the race to win? I mean, if you're going to run, let's be people that run to win, right? Any, everybody likes to win, right? A any competitors in the house that, 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 that like to compete. So if we're going to do something, we want to do the very, very best that we can and run life to win. Thank God for relationships with, with people like Pastor Clay that, that you know, that, that challenge us to, to become better for God. We were, we were here last year, you know, experiencing Dream Fest with you guys. We were able to come here and serve at that Dream Fest. And that was a, a great honor for us to be able to bring our, our core group from our home church and just be able to come here and serve. And we were really excited about it. And whenever we got here, you know, we, we just begin to serve and just try to understand the flow of how things done because we actually wanted to have one at our church. And so here it is almost, about, I don't know, about eight months later. And we have been trying to, to get it organized where we could do it at our church. And it just seemed like every avenue that we went down, the door seemed to kind of close. But then this month, while we were in the middle of this fasting period, you know, separating ourselves from certain things and trying to reconnect with God, God just began to open up doors for us. So now, next month, February the 22nd, we're going to host our first annual Dream Fest because of what we learned here. So we're running this race together, and we need to understand that we can learn from others because we all have a purpose in life. And God wants us to fulfill our God-given purpose. But how many of us know that this race is not about competition? I'm not competing against you. You're not competing against me. This race is about completion. So we're all in this thing together. And we need to understand that God wants us to complete the race. The church is one unit. And we're all running together. And we all have our significant role. We all play an important part in this amazing race of life. 
And, and, and we play that part so that we can fulfill our God-given purpose. Now, if you have on your God jersey today, you're running for Team Jesus. You can pop your collar and say, yeah, I'm on Team Jesus. I'm running for him. I'm running this race to win. You're running to win, but you're running not for a temporal trophy, something that's temporary. It's going to be a Super Bowl play next week. Who are you pulling for? Seahawks. No Denver fans? Nobody wants to see Peyton get number two? All right. Should be a great game. It's going to be a great matchup. The best offense against the best defense. But you know what? That, those guys are going to be out there on that field putting their lives literally on the line for a trophy that's going to perish. It's going to fade away. But Paul says we're in the amazing race of life and we're running for a, a, a trophy, an eternal prize that's never going to tarnish, that's never going to fade away. So we, we have to understand that in this amazing race of life, we need to take every step with a sense of purpose. Every day when we get up, we need to be asking God, God, what is on your schedule for me to accomplish today? God, what are the things that you want to see happen in my life today? God, what are the, the people that, or who are the people that you want me to impact their lives today? And as we begin to start our life off like that each and every day, we're putting God first. We're creating room. We're creating space for Him to be able to operate in because we're putting Him into the equation. And when He's in the equation, we find solutions to our problems. And when we put Him first, we're just asking Him to prepare us for the day that we have. How many of us know that we need His grace in our life each and every day? We, we need His mercy. I, I mean, if it wasn't for His grace and mercy, that's the only reason we, we were able to get up this morning. We didn't get up within our own strength. We got up within the power that He has given us because of His, his, because of his grace and His mercy. And if we knew some of the things that we were going to face on a daily basis, we wouldn't even want to get up sometimes because life is tough sometimes. And we experience all different kinds of things. I just want to tell you a little story about how our day started in the amazing race of life on yesterday. My son and I, we're, we're new to this, this duck hunting thing. We went um, Thanksgiving. We've been watching too much Duck Dynasty. But we, we went Thanksgiving Day, and I mean, we were just hooked. We were hooked because um, we, we were all able to, to just be together, it's something we could all do together. It's not like deer hunting. I mean, you got to go out and do that all day. I just don't have time for that. But duck hunting, I mean, you can go out early in the morning. It takes just a little bit of time. I want to try to explain it to you for those of you that have never been. And, and, and you, you can be back home. Hey, back home by 8 or 8.30. But yesterday, it was really cold. And we've been hearing all season long how you need to go whenever, you know, the water's frozen and there's only going to be a little bit of water running. And that's where the ducks will all come to. We, my son and I, we get up early in the morning. Uh, about 5 o'clock, we're up. Six o'clock, we're down at the place that we're supposed to be at, and it's going to be getting daylight about 10 minutes to 7, and that's whenever the ducks start coming in. And I, I mean, it's just amazing how they come in at the same time in the morning, and then they come back in at the same time in the evening. But, but we have to go about 150 yards out into the swamp. It's dark. We got this little light on our head, and it's 17 degrees outside on top of that. And we, and we got all this gear on. My son looks at me when we get out of the truck. He's like, Daddy, you like you like you about to go to war. I said, I am. I'm about to go to war with some ducks. We get to the place. We walk through the woods. It's about 50 yards or so. And we have to walk almost to, almost to the light out here in frozen water. I mean, we're having to break ice. I'm breaking it in front of my son so he, he can come in behind me. And, and in some places, I'm actually walking on top of the ice. And you'll go about 10 or 12 steps or so, and boosh, you fall back into the water, and it comes up to about your waist. I mean, it's freezing cold. And by the time we get to the place that we're supposed to be at, man, this dude is wore out. I mean, I have had it. I'm done. I, I don't even want to see no ducks. I'm hassling. I got all this stuff on. I can't wait to try to get it off. And I'm drenched in sweat. And it's 17 degrees outside. And I'm sweating. And he looks at me, and I look at him. I'm like, man... I don't know about this thing. So, so we stay there and, and we have, we don't kill anything. We just come back out and on the way back out, he speaks exactly what's on my mind because as I'm going through breaking the ice in front of him, by the time he gets through, it's already frozen back. It's cold outside, folks. 
I don't know who talked us into this duck or anything, but we were, we were kind of having second thoughts. And, and he says, you know what, Daddy, we learned something on this. I said, yeah, we did. We ain't never coming whenever it's froze like this again. If we can't get to some moving water that's real easy, we're, 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 we're just not coming. But I enjoyed the time being able to bond with him because he learned something and I did as well. And as the day goes on, we're on a funeral um, that, that's absolutely amazing there in our, our town. We go to this funeral and it goes on for about an hour and a half. And we need to hurry up and get down here. So we come outside to our vehicle that we parked prior to going into the funeral with all of our luggage and everything in it to come to Barefoot. And we're blocked in. We can't get out because there's like 500 people at this funeral. And we look around. I tell my wife, I'm like, oh, man. So we have to get someone to take us back home to get another vehicle and then start coming this way. So whenever we start coming this way, we're following one of your local church members. I won't mention who he is. But anyway, we're following him, and, he's, and I'm telling my wife, you know, stay up with them. They'll get you there. I'm kind of looking over my notes, you know, just trying to let things go back through my mind of what, what we're going to be talking about. And, and, and we get up to this red light, and she's in the wrong lane. And I'm saying, hurry up. You can make it. You can make it. You know, I'm coaching her along. Hurry up. You can make it. You can make it through the light. And... As she goes through the light, it's just a, it's a little bit red. And she makes it through, uh, unscathed, no injuries or anything. But when we go through the light, I say, oh, there's a cop right there. And sure enough, he turns around. I said, and he's coming back. So we get on down, and, and I'm asked, I said, where are we at? Where are we at? And then I start to look around, and I kind of get my bearings of where we are. I said, oh, we're in Whiteville. I said, this is a good place to be right now. Because Barefoot has a church in Whiteville. So when he gets up here, you tell him we're on our way to Myrtle Beach to preach at Barefoot Church. So when he gets up to the car, she begins to, you know, just tell him, he, he says, you know, what, what's going on or, or, or where are you heading? She was like, he has to preach at Barefoot Church in Myrtle Beach. And I got my suit on, so, you know, I'm looking like I'm getting ready to go preach. And, 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 and he says, well, okay, I'll be right back. So he goes back to his car and he comes back. And, you know, before we left the house, I just, you know, said, Holy Ghost, go before us, because I already knew what kind of trip it was going to be. We were trying to, we were running a little bit late, trying to hurry up and get here. Don't try this at home. But anyway, he comes back to the car, and he says, you know what? You said the magic word. I said, uh-oh, might be getting a break here. And uh, she, he says, um, you said the magic word, church. I was like, yes, yes, we're in there now. And he said, I'm just going to write you a warning ticket. And I was, I was just so thankful for God's grace and his mercy. And after we leave from there, she continues to drive, and we come up to a same situation. I said, you need to stop. Don't abuse God's grace. We, get, we got off that last time. We might not get off so easy this time. But we need God's grace in our life, right? That, that's why it's so important for us to start our day off, you know, in, in prayer, asking God, God, go before me, because I don't know what's out there. You don't know what's out there, but God does. And he wants to cover us with his grace. And he wants us to understand that we can run this amazing race of life through team Jesus and actually win. Because when God is in the equation, he answers the problems that we have to face. So if we're not including him, Paul says we're shadow boxing. Any shadow boxers in the house? Anybody? Nobody shadow boxes? You don't ever box your shadow? Why, why don't you box your shadow? Because there's, I mean, it's irrelevant, right? There, you, you never hit your target, do you? Because there's nothing there but a shadow. So Paul says it's irrelevant if we get up every day and, and we're not running this race with a sense of purpose, with a sense of passion. He says every step that I take, I need to be running it with a sense of passion because God has a purpose. So if we're going to run, let's include God. And let's include God so that we can run to win. I want to draw out about four, you know, specific things here in the book of Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 2 that are going to help us get a little bit clearer understanding of some things that we need to incorporate into this amazing race. And in Isaiah 54 and 2, it says, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, don't hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. How many know that before God can perform a great work through you, he has to do a great work in you? 
Come on, somebody. He has to do a great work in you. Before we can go out and minister and serve in the capacity that God wants us to serve in, he has to do something great with inside of us. Because if not, we'll be acting off of raw emotions. We'll do it off of feelings. But when we incorporate him in, then we have on a mindset and an attitude of service to run this race. To run this race with purpose. But we need to understand that through this race, it's a process. There's going to be some difficult areas in our life. There's going to even be some discomfort. But, but through all of that, when we're willing to step out and do it with a sense of purpose, there'll be growth that comes out of that process. Though we endure the pain, that brings growth in our life. Because we like to be comfortable people, don't we? We do. We like to be, you're comfortable right now, aren't you? It's cold outside. You were able to, to come into a nice heated facility, sit down in nice chairs, and just be comfortable. But how many know that the, the church is not a country club? It's not a resort. And you have some great ones around here. We were, we were looking at them this morning. Some great resorts around here. But the church is not viewed as a country club or a resort to where you just come in and people serve you. The church is here for service, for us to serve one another. And as we begin to do that, we understand that the church is designed to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Do you get what I'm saying? The church is designed that whenever we get into our comfort zone that we feel like we don't have to serve at DreamFest, which is coming up. And I challenge you, as, as the man of God already made mention, that God's word challenges us. I challenge you to get involved in that ministry because it's more than just passing out a piece of meat or handing out a loaf of bread. It's impacting somebody's life that's going to change their life forever because you become the hands and the feet of Jesus when we serve in that kind of capacity. So you know what we're doing? We're changing lives that change the world. And we're comforting the disturbed because they feel in their life that there is no hope. But you're letting them know that there is a hope and His name is Jesus Christ. And as you begin to serve in that kind of capacity, yeah, come on and give it up for Jesus. Come on and give it up for Him. When you serve in that kind of capacity with a purpose and a passion, we're running this race together. And you're letting people know you're providing hope in what appears to be a hopeless situation. So we're here this morning to challenge you Comfortable people. We're here to challenge you to go out and become comfort to the disturbed people. Those that are on the verge of their marriages falling apart. You can provide comfort. The church is here for that. If you're in the middle of a financial struggle and you don't know what, what's going on or how you're going to make it, folks can begin to encourage you and we provide comfort to what appears to be a disturbed situation. What appears to be hopeless. God wants us to run this race with a purpose for Him. This amazing race. Because God is looking for participants, not passengers. He's looking for people that will get in the game. People that will become game changers for Him. To, to go out and not, not be ashamed of the gospel. To go out and be bold witnesses for Him. But not be rude at the same time. Be, be people that, that are willing to witness to others and do it in a manner that exalts God. We're not here trying to, to build something great. We're here to do something great. We're here to do something great for God because when we begin to do it great for Him, He's going to build it for us because it's about His kingdom, as Pastor Clay told us. It's about His kingdom. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. The church is the bride of Christ, but He uses the church. He uses you. He uses you. He uses you to advance His kingdom. God wants us to run this race with the sense of purpose, the amazing race of life. How many of us know that we serve a diverse God? None of us were made the same. That means that we can't all run in the same lane. You have to run in your lane. God has a course designed for you, and I have to run in my lane. I, I, I can't run your lane for you. You can't run my lane for me. We all one day are going to have to give an account for what we've done in this life. When we stand before God. And, and so you have to run your race. I can't run it for you. I can't encourage you. I, I, I can't, you know, offer words of encouragement as we're running together. But God just simply wants you to be you. Run the lane. Run the course that God has placed before you. Don't try to be me. And I'm not going to try to be you. But we can't get caught up in that sometimes, can we? 
We can look over at other people and see how they're running their race and Man, they're doing good, and they're not struggling with anything. And, and we're over here, it seems like we're fighting tooth and nail. And we can get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in that, because God has a purpose for you. And He's taking you through the lane that you're in for a reason. And that reason is to fulfill the purpose that He has for your life. Just be you. Because you know what? God is pleased in who you are because He created you. You don't have to try to be anyone else. We can be ourselves. We can run in the lane that He has placed before us. In a race, all runners are running. Paul says everybody's in this race. But all runners don't run the same. In fact, when you, when you see runners run, um, they, they have different strategies for finishing. Some will hold back in the beginning and try to you know, finish real strong at the end. Me, I just try to make it through. I'm not a runner. <laughs> I, I, can't, I see people running on the treadmill, and man, it just give me the elliptical. You know, I, I, I just don't have the, the energy to be able to, 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 to fulfill that, that running process. But, you know, there are great things in that. And, and not everyone runs the same. Some have longer strides. You know, some, some are like Pastor Clay. They're, they're tall, and, you know, he can take one step, and it takes me about five to get to that one. But, you know, all runners, they're, they're run, they have different strategies, different ways that they run, but they're all running. And they're all running for a purpose. But you know what? One thing that you see all runners do before they get ready to run, you see them get loose, don't you? See them stretch their muscles out. Begin, begin to see them. I told you I wasn't a runner, so I can't really. They, they begin to stretch these muscles back here. And they get on down there, you know, and they, they, they want to make sure that they got it worked out real good. This is probably the most stretching I've done in a while. But, but, but they begin to stretch those muscles out because the stretch is preparing them for what's about to take place. And, and they're preparing their muscles for what is about the pressure that's about to be applied to it. If we're going to run this amazing race called life, we have to be people that are willing to stretch. The stretching process is making preparation for what's about to come see because if we don't stretch then it's very likely that we can become injured I, I saw my wife yesterday she was getting on the treadmill and then whenever she got off she was stretching I, me when I get off man I'm done <laughs> but but she was stretching I said you know what that is good because you're stretching out what you just used and, and if you're stretching it out there's less likely for you to have an injury later on so, so oftentimes in this race of life that we're in, this amazing race, we don't find time to stretch, do we? Because life seems to be a rat race. And everything is just running around and we're saying, God, I need you now. God, I want you to fix this for me right now. I need your blessings right now. But if we're not willing to go through the stretch, then oftentimes we squander the blessings that he has for us because we're not prepared to receive them. I don't know about you, but I want God to put me through the stretch. Even though I have a hard time stretching physically, muscles are tight just from that little bit. But even though I, I have a hard time stretching physically, I want God to stretch me spiritually so that I can handle the purpose that he has for me, so that I can handle what he has in store for me. And if we're willing to go through the stretch process, we can run this race to win. The stretch requires us to move outside of our normal routine. Many people are no longer in this race and running to win because they're not willing to endure short-term pain for long-distance gain. Not willing to endure that, that little bit of short-term pain that you're going to go through to endure long-distance gain. I don't know about you, but I'm running for a prize. I'm running for a prize that is eternal, a long distance gain and God has called us to be all in this amazing race of life let's look back at Isaiah 54 and 2 it says enlarge the place of your tent stretch your tent curtains out wide I touch and agree with what the pastor said he made a statement earlier in his introduction that this place is not going to be able to contain what God is going to do God is stretching you right now to do something great in your life and he's going to use you in a magnificent way because God, what God is saying right here is that where I'm getting ready to take you, you're unable to contain it in the form that you're in. But if you're willing to go through the stretch process, if you're willing to stretch out your tent curtains wide, then you're going to be able to handle 
what I have in store for you. I, I have boys at home and, and my daughter, we have five kids. And, you know, oftentimes in the background, you can hear them making statements about me. They say that, you know, daddy got us stretched out around here. They tell people I work them like a little Hebrew slave. I was like, no, I'm just trying to prepare you guys. Because, you know, one day you're not going to be at 1916 Rowan Road. When you decide that you want to get married and you want to have a family, you got to go, homie. That's what my dad told me. You know, because this place ain't big enough for all of us. I mean, we barely getting by now. You got seven people under one roof. I mean, we, we have a large family. But, but what I'm trying to do in that stretch process for them is get them to understand that you need to have a work ethic in life. And, and young men, as my children, I, I want them to understand that they need to be the leaders of their home. They need to work things out. And as they begin to work those things out, a man that's failing to lead is leading in failure. Because God has called us as men to lead. And, and you know what? We could fix a lot of problems in America if, if we could put a man in the home that was willing to lead. And, and, and God wants to do that in your life. He, and that's not, that's not a discard or a throw off to anyone else because God has called us all for a purpose. And we need to under the responsi understand the responsibilities that we have. So when I have them stretched out, they have chores that they need to do. I'm just trying to prepare them for what's to come because reality is going to come. And if we're not prepared for life, life will chew you up and spit you out and have no regards whatsoever. It will. And we need to understand that we need to be able to, to go through the stretch process to be able to endure this amazing race of life. The stretch prepares us for what's to come. Some of you are preparing for the stretch right now. The marriage that you, that you thought was desolate, the financial situation that appears to be, be no hope. Maybe, maybe the enemy has confused some of you and telling you that even your life is not even worth living anymore. But I want to let you know that there's hope in Jesus Christ. There, there is a, a risen king and a risen savior, and he has a purpose for your life. Don't allow him to steal, don't allow the enemy to steal that life from you. There, there is hope. And, and, and God wants us to understand that we're preparing ourselves for the stretch process. Stretch out your curtains wide, Barefoot Church. This, this Old Testament passage here is a representation of the, the modern day tab, the modern day church. Because increase is coming. Increase is coming, but we have to be willing to endure the stretch. I believe that this year it is going to be a banner year. I believe that it's going to be a banner year not only in this church, but in thir churches throughout the land because I believe that God is doing something spectacular. I believe that, that God is working behind the scenes and He's been putting us through the stretch process in 2013 to prepare us for what we're about to receive in 2014. And it's going to be great. It's going to be something that's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow my mind because we're in, we're in this thing together and we're working to change lives that change the world. Not only do we be willing to endure the stretch process, but we need to be people that are lengthening. Isaiah 54 and 2 says, lengthen your cords. The cords were used to tie down the tent. Really what the prophet is saying here is that the cords represent reaching for a greater purpose in life. Going farther in our, our output and our inputs than we ever have before. Going the extra mile because we understand that every detail matters. ED40, you know that statement, right? I know you've heard that around here, that the details matter because God is in the details. And we've kind of taken that series that, that, that Pastor Clay, he just let us in on that insight, and God just began to do great things. And, and we've been teaching on that series for about four weeks now, how that God is in the details of our life. And God is in the details of your life because he has a purpose for your life. He wants us to walk out those details and understand that we are living a life of significance for Him. Your life matters because He all has a role for us to play in this amazing race called life. Let's move beyond just doing the bare minimum to get by. Stop, stop chasing the crowd or what's trending or what's popular. How many know that Jesus was not about chasing the crowd. Je Jesus didn't chase crowds. In fact, you find him oftentimes that he was disconnecting 
from the crowd. Now, he was there to perform miracles, but after those miracles were performed, he would kind of just steal away. He would slip off into the background. In fact, John 6 and 14 through verse 15 lets us know that when people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we've been expecting. Now, they've been expecting for a Messiah to come and set up an earthly reign right there and become their king. And so they see Jesus doing these miracles. So they're, they're at the point to where they're ready to crown him as their king, their earthly king. So he just kind of slips off to the side. Look what it says. It says that, let me find my bearings here. Verse 15 says, when Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to become their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now Jesus had just fed 5,000 people with a Jewish happy meal. Two fish and five loaves of bread. He had just done something spectacular, something amazing. And, and at, at the end of that feeding, he tells his disciples, look, you guys go get you a basket of peas. Go get you a basket. And you go around and you get all the leftovers that are left. What, what, why, did he, why did he tell them to do that? Why, why did he want them to do that? Because he was lengthening the thought process of the leaders that he had, his disciples. He was showing them that he was that, that they served a God that was more than enough. Because there was more at the end than there was in the beginning. And we need to understand that we don't have to have a poverty mentality level, that, that you know that, that we're that, that things are scarce, that, that God just barely gives us enough to get by. No, we serve a God that is more than enough. He's able to meet every need that you have. In fact, he says that he will give you the desires of your heart if we will follow after him. Those things that we desire, he'll give them to us because he's a God of more than enough. So if we understand, you know, that, that he's trying to change the thought process of his disciples, that he, he's trying to change our thought process as well, that he can meet those needs that we have in our life. Because Jesus wasn't about chasing the crowd. Jesus was about creating a, a movement. And when we're creating a movement for the kingdom of God, we're doing it for a purpose so that lives can be changed. And whenever we create a movement, people are stretching. Cords are being lengthened. When you have 410 decisions to follow after Christ in one day, that's creating a movement, folks. And that, that happened here last month. And you guys have created, come on, you can do better than that little golf clap. Come on, give it up for Jesus. I mean, 410 people, that's amazing. That's more than most churches can even hold. 410 decisions. And that's creating a movement. And if we are willing to create those kind of movements for God, don't worry about the crowd. They're going to come. When we create movements like that, the crowd is going to follow because you know what? They're looking for something that you already have if you have on your God jersey. They're, they're looking for what you have. And they're, they're wanting to fill that God void that they have in their life. And when we create opportunities like that, we're creating a movement for God to fulfill the purpose that he has in our life. We need to be people that are willing to stretch and are willing to lengthen. A, ru a runner lengthens their distance and increases their opportunity to win when they're willing to put in the extra work. When we're willing to get on the front lines and serve for God, we're lengthening our cords. We're doing more in our output. And we're not doing it, you know, to, to, to just kind of receive some merit our way into heaven. No, no amount of our good deeds or, or efforts could actually get us into heaven. We're just doing it out of sense of gratitude with an attitude, saying, thank you, God, for what you've done for me. And now we're able to, to, to really serve in a new capacity. And that, that's what it's all about, us getting together and doing life together and helping each other and encouraging each other as a church to run this race with a sense of purpose. Not only do we need to stretch and lengthen, but we also need to strengthen. Isaiah 54 and 2 says, Strengthen your stakes. The stakes here represent the load-bearing anchor which held the tent down, held the curtains in place, and, 
and, and help the cords to be able to maintain the purpose that they had. Runners only become stronger when they're consistent in their training. Today's culture and society, everybody wants results without resistance. We want the look without having the labor. We want to win without the workout. We want the blessings of God without change. And I find myself, you know, there, oftentimes I, I watch these infomercials at, at, info commercials at the house, and I don't even know if I said that right, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, and I see these commercials about all these strength and tone machines, and, you know, I get all hyped up because they show what it looks like afterwards. But how many know that they don't, get, they don't get that look just by going up there on TV? I mean, they got to put something in. And we all want that look, but we don't want to put in the labor or the time or the effort to be able to get there. And my wife's just laying in the bed cracking up at me because I'm like, I'm going to get that. You know, I can, I can do that right there. And she's like, you, you ain't even going to use it. Why are you going to buy it? We, we want the look, but we don't want to put in the labor, right? Because we want to be comfortable in the situation that we're in. But God is calling us to a place to where we need to be people that are willing to strengthen our stakes. Life is a process. And we have to be willing to change because change is the catalyst for growth. We have to be willing to prepare ourselves to run this race to win. If we're going to be able to strengthen ourselves through the power of God, we need to understand that we need to be willing to help those that are weak. Because whether we want to admit it or not, life is a process and somewhere along that process, we all get weak from time to time. And we need somebody to help encourage us in life we we need somebody to come by and offer our arm of encouragement and say you know what you can make it there is hope i can't run your lane but you know what i can help you in your lane i i, I can come by when i see you struggling and offer words of encouragement and just begin to build you up and that that's the responsibility of the church for us to encourage one another to continue to run to strengthen the things that god is calling us to to run this amazing race with a sense of purpose. Look what Romans 15 and 1 says. It says, Now we who are strong are to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just to please ourselves. This race is just not about us. When we come to church, it's just not about us. It's about the whole body. It's about us fulfilling the purpose that we have, and we serving one another. We're in this thing together. So let's encourage one another in the faith. Those of us who are strong, when we see people struggling, let's offer words of encouragement and let them know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. Let's build each other up and offer a helping hand. And when we do that, we're championing the cause of Jesus Christ. We're letting them know that there is a champion, there is a Lord that is King of Kings, and He's already run the race. And he's already run that race so that we could be in the race. So that we could put on our God jersey. And die to the world and come up resurrected through a baptism. And let people know that we're in this thing for real. That we want to be game changers. That we're like Romans 1 and 16. That I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power unto salvation. That we run this race with boldness. Because He's all called us to run. And to run, we have to be willing to stretch. We have to be willing to lengthen. We have to be willing to be people that are strengthening so that we can finish. God has called us to be finishers. He's equipped us with this resource in the person of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit to finish, to run this race to win. What you're doing matters. I want to let you know that we all live a life of significance. And what you're doing, this race that we're in called life, you matter. You have a purpose. You have a role to fulfill. And God wants to do it so that we'll be people that finish. If you will, can you kind of just turn to the side screen so that we can show a video that will help us get a better understanding of what it is to really finish. You think you've got
That video was about a man by the name of Derek Redmond. And that was the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. And he had raced in the 1988 Olympics and uh, injured his Achilles. But he came back from that injury, and here he was prepared in 1992. He had already broken the British world record in his class in the 400 meter. And here he finds himself in the middle of a race that he is prepared for, that he is ready to take. And this is a qualifying heat round to advance to the finals. And before the race, he and his father have a conversation. And Derek's goal is just to win a medal. He doesn't care whether it's silver, gold, or bronze. He just wanted to win. And in the race, he injures his hamstring. But prior to the race, his father had this conversation and said, you know what, Derek? It doesn't matter what place we come in. He said, but we're going to finish this race. We're going to finish this race if we have to finish it together. I encourage you today to know that we can finish this race together. You saw him in agony and pain as he lied there on the, on the asphalt. He could have very easily given up. Dreams dashed. Looks like hope is gone. Things are helpless. But you know what? He rises up and says, you know what? I'm going to finish. The other runners, the race was over as far as they were concerned. The race was finished. But he had some intestinal fortitude to get up and say, you know what, I'm going to finish as well. Though it might be excruciating pain, though my father might have to come down out of the stands and help me make it across the finish line, I'm going to finish. I want to let you know that God sees your pain. He sees our weakness. and He's able to help us finish the race. I want to challenge you today to stay in the race. Don't give up hope. Finish what God has started in your life. It doesn't matter if we have to limp across the finish line. It doesn't matter if we have to hop. It doesn't matter if you have to get down on your knees and you have to crawl across the finish line. Finish the race that God has started within you. Because the Word of God says He will complete what He has started in you. God wants us to be people that finish. Are you ready to finish the race today? Are you ready to let's run together? Every head bowed. Maybe you're here today and you're not running for Team Jesus. Maybe you have a desire right now to get on the team that actually wins. And we're all running in this race. But Paul says only one team is going to win. Only one team is going to experience eternal life. Only one team is going to get that great prize. If that's you today, and you want to start fresh right now in this amazing race of life. And you want to run for Team Jesus. Would you lift your hand? I want to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Pray this prayer with me. You can just say it in your, right, right where you're sitting at. Lord Jesus, I come to you now. And I thank you for this opportunity to run this race of life. And I know that it's only through your son Jesus. I thank you that he died for me and now I'm able to experience true life in him. I thank you for this team that I'm on now and I know that now my life has been radically changed because I've chosen him as Lord of my life. And right now, I'm going to allow him to lead my life. And I'm going to run on the team that wins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you for making that decision. You're on the greatest team there is. Welcome to the family of God. Maybe you're here this morning and you're already on Team Jesus. But maybe you just need some encouraging. I want to pray with you as well. Maybe you're struggling with some things. You feel like that you can't make it. That all hope is gone. I want to let you know that there's hope today. There's hope for you to be able to finish the race. There's hope for you be, to be able to finish what God has started in you. If that's you, would you lift your hand? God bless you. 
God bless you. God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, I come to you right now, Lord. And I thank you, God, for these that have acknowledged, Lord, that they just need an encouraging hand. And I pray right now, Lord, that you would wrap your arms of love and protection around them. God, that they will be able to feel your presence like never before. God, that they will put their trust in you like never before. God, help them to be able to endure the stretch, dear God. Help them, dear God, to lengthen their cords for you, their output, Lord, to fulfill the purpose that you have for their life. God, help them to be strengthened, dear God, and help them, God, to be finishers in you. God, let them experience you in a new way today, God. Let them have hope, dear God, that they can rise every day of their life and have the assurance to know that they're running on the team that wins. Father, I pray that you would do something great and fantastic in their life right now. In Jesus' name. God bless you, Barefoot Church. Stay in the race and finish what God has started.